at the end of them of my money. <laughs> Have you ever been there? Yeah. Yeah. I was a carer. My wife was sick in bed. So I cared for my wife, I went to work, and I brought up my children. And that meant that I had to move country, and change job, and change what I could do, because I didn't have enough. There was too much month at the end of my money. And that is true for too many people in our town and in the South. I have a little house in Luton because it's the only place that I could afford to buy a house in. And I will pay that off by the time I'm 70. But I know I'm lucky. Because now people can't buy the house in Luton because the prices have gone up. <coughs> and all I want to say tonight is you are welcome here. Not by a church who has everything. Not by a church that has the power but by a church that says, we walk where you walk. We want a voice for the poor that says, where are the houses coming from? Where is the money coming from to pay the food? Where, how are we going to pay for the electricity when we've got to make that choice between food or money in the meter? And we just want to say, you are welcome here. We believe that enough is enough. And we hope that this is a springboard for a voice to be heard and a conversation to be had. And we want to be saying that if you want us involved in a conversation, you want us to connect with you in many different ways, that we are here because this is a building for Luton. This is a building for Lutonians. And we want to be united in saying, enough is enough. And you're all very welcome. When we're out on delivery, we get to know our customers. We know that Helen at number three is at an appointment and she's going to be laid back, so we deliver her parcel later. We know it's not. Um, oh, sorry, I'm sorry. We know Pam A2 is away for the week, so the fact that we haven't seen them as normal is, is nothing to worry about. We know that people are waiting on important letters, packets, and parcels and they've chosen us to make sure they receive those letters and parcels. We deliver a service that makes us proud. We deliver more than just letters and parcels, and it's just as important to us as it is our customers. Um, the reason we've chose to strike are two separate issues. Um, the first issue is pay. So the price of sending through war mail has gone up. The board and, and CEOs have seen hefty bonuses and shares. The CEOs have had minimum pay rises of well over 20%, yet we've only had two. Um, whilst my colleagues and myself are struggling to pay rent, fuel for food and utilities, the rest of them are holiday and abroad. I'm, I'm aware the second strike action is over, over terms and conditions and changes of hours. I'm aware that things must evolve and change, and I'm prepared to change. I am not prepared to sign away my terms and conditions. I am not prepared for new colleagues that I work with being on a lesser pay and a lower terms and conditions for doing the same job that I do. the workers who make the profits and put in the graph will bear the brunt financially on wage that sees us less on the minimum we need to survive. Physically on terms and conditions that will see the workforce work off in, worse off in real terms. When building something you start from the bottom and you work your way up. Why are the people at the bottom being forgotten and crippled? Why is this trust building the economy from the top? The bankers, the oil giants, the CEOs all benefiting from billions of pounds worth of bonuses. This crisis will affect everyone.
going. It's the workers in this country that spend their money that keeps this country going, it keeps the economy going. And if we aren't spending it because we haven't got it, more places will be shut and more jobs will be lost. During the pandemic, I was having chemotherapy treatment. I was on the other side of the coin. I was put into a bubble with the clinically vulnerable, and the nurses on the chemotherapy ward and my oncologist put their lives at risk to help people like me survive cancer. I witnessed firsthand the drop in the amount of cancer patients allowed to receive treatment at one time. In the once overcrowded chemotherapy unit that was normally filled to the brim was now running at two in for treatment and four in for waiting. I lost people I met on my journey because they were too at risk from catching COVID to, to be allowed treatment. I watched those nurses work hard before COVID and you wouldn't have thought they would have had any more work in them, but they pulled it out of the bag and they saved people like me. On a Thursday night, I would go along with the rest of my country and clap them on the doorstep. My postman played a vital role in keeping me connected during lockdown. He bought my NHS letters, my appointments, my government updates, my medication. He was one of the few people I see and I applauded him too. In fact, I applauded every single carer, teacher, bin man, taxi bus, rail, shopping <laughs> that held this nation together and played a vital role and now fighting for a pay rise. Not to have the terms and the conditions exploited. These people aren't being greedy, they're just asking for fairness. They should not be worrying whether their child needs a warm coat or shoes. They should not have to make a choice between heating and eating. No one should. They should not worry because they were out on delivery yesterday and got wet and now they can't afford to dry their clothes. We were told to stay at home to protect the NHS while our elected parted. And now we're told if we get a pay rise, it will send the inflation up. I'm, I'm no mathematician, but something's not adding up here. I'm really lucky though. So far, I've been able to work no matter how tough I find it. But I know there are so many others in so much pain that their choice to work is taken away from circumstances beyond their control. I, like many, have tried to take a second job and I'm relying on my son. To, to help me manage that job. I don't know how long my health or my strength will, rely, will help me rely on that. Sometimes I can be just too tired to be angry about how they treat us, but I think they want us to be tired. I think they want us too weak to fight, but we owe it to ourselves and those that are too weak to stand up. We need to tell them that they're not alone and we're all in this together. I am fed up of getting through the day by telling myself things can't get worse, because it is. My food bill increases every week, prices seem to change overnight. So unless we stand up, we unite, we stop allowing them to divide us and we say enough is enough, this is gonna get worse. to make meals stretch, buy a £20 kettle that saves you £10 on your 2500 electric bill, cancelling Netflix, selling items you've worked hard all your life for just to buy electric. I would rather not have gas than be paying the debt for the next 10 years of my life. It's not right that CEOs are earning more an hour than a member of their staff earning a week. We really need to turn our anger into action, just as Zara says. We need to get behind this movement. If you're not in a union, you need to join one. Please, even if your workplace hasn't a union body, you can still become a member. I'm sure there'll be people here tonight that can point you in the right direction. We need to realise our worth. 
the same worth that we got recognised for during the pandemic. We all play a vital role and we've proved it. We need to harness our strengths and unity to drive the change that is needed for millions of people struggling across the country. We need to share our message across social media, when walking the dog, down the food bank. We need to contact our MPs. They're elected to represent our best interests. There are people trying to weaken us and break our spirit just in case we create this change. And whilst there's no promise that we'll get the outcome we deserve, I'd rather go down now knowing I gave it everything than be left wondering what could have been cheap if we all stood together.
We were buried with many as three or four of our family, friends and neighbours while still making sure that others in our town were fed. And you know, we did that because, because we had to, because community was all we had. There was nowhere else to turn to. And as difficult as that was, I'm really proud of this place. I'm really proud of this community. I'm really proud of what we did. Um, and, I really, and I really hope that if you take away anything from what I have to say, today is about what this place is and who we are. Um, I really want you to understand what that time, and what this time, this time right now, is like for us. As the cost of living rises, and to put that generosity and giving that I've talked about in our community into context, Luton is one of the poorest towns in the country. <laughs> I don't have the latest figures, but I know that around half of our children are growing up in poverty. We're living in unsuitable, crowded homes. And it's a pattern that's replicated up and down the country. Almost half of the total Muslim population in the United Kingdom live in 10% of the most deprived areas in England. We experience the lowest earnings of any religious group in the country. I think it equates to roughly 350 pounds less than our, our counterparts every month. And we're disproportionately working class. And if you want to understand the relationship between class and race, please just take a look at the state of British Muslims. And the second thing I guess that I'd really like to take away today being working class is not an identity, it's a social economic position that so many of us in this room share. Taj talked before about the language of division that we often have associated with this town, but you know what? It's that position that unites so many of us. Again, despite that position, this town gave, gives, giving beyond our means, giving whilst we go hungry ourselves, giving to others whilst we go hungry ourselves. I've done that, I've done it myself. We've just heard from Emma out there, despite her own struggles, because we need to support each other. And on a personal note, for me, I do that. I do that because my heart, my actions are led by my faith. But I'm here today to say there really is nothing left to give. So where does that leave me? It leaves me to join you all to say enough really is enough. sustains us, sustains me, your politics are literally killing us, yeah. mm -hmm. literally killing us. This has gone beyond having to choose between eating and eating, we're way past choosing between eating and eating. We're now at the stage where we can neither eat our homes nor feed our children, that's where we are. I wasn't, I wasn't entirely sure, I only confirmed with Tag this morning um, that I was going to be here. And I wasn't going to be here because um, one of our imams passed away in Yemen last week. And I didn't want to be here necessarily, but I, I wanted to be here, but I wasn't sure I could be here because of that loss. But actually it's the loss that brings us together and it's the, the, the loss that compels me to be here. Um, Others have spoken way more eloquently than I can, than I can um, about, about the loss. But it's the loss that brings us together. Um, and it's, it, it's a loss... It's a loss 
cost and a give that, that just can't go on. The Quran, I said there was going to be violence, I said there was going to be politics. Um, the Quran commands us, commands me as a Muslim, and a direct command in the Quran. So the Quran, for those who don't know, is made up of lots of things. We've got some good, some good guidance, but there are some direct commands in there. And one of the direct commands is stand for justice. Um, and that's why I'm here today. I'm here today to stand for justice. I'm here today, um, I don't know to say to you, I don't want to miss you all. Emma, I'm here to say that we will stand with you because that's the right thing to do. Um, I'm here to say to everyone who has struggled, as I have, as the families that I have supported have, as the families that we continue to try and take through this difficult time have, um, we are going to be, I'm, I'm here to stand for all of you. And that starts with all of us telling the truth and acknowledging the reality of where we are. Um, and particularly, particularly to look at our most marginalized communities and say that we are here with you too. I'm just gonna close by going back to that time in the pandemic. Um, and yes, we were socially isolated, but I felt I felt really alone during that time. It was really difficult. Um, and you felt alone because you were trying to feed people and make sure people don't go hungry. You are trying to support people as they're unable to bury their loved ones themselves. You are tired, you're exhausted, and you're turning on the TV and you're saying and you're hearing people tell you that you've only got yourself to blame. Um, because you know so many of us, British Muslims, only 10 or 15% of us are in professional jobs. Most of us are your posties, we are your cleaners, we're your security guards, we're your nurses, we're your doctors, we are um, all of those people who couldn't sit in an office at home and do the work. We were people quite literally at the coalface in so many ways and also demonised. Um, and that was a really lonely, lonely time for us. And so, as I stand here and follow that command of God to stand for justice, I'm gonna ask you to just do the same. Um, join me in that. Stand with us, all of us, together. Enough is enough.
trying to create a scapegoat out of one community. When the real enemy is sitting here at the top, yeah. laughing all the way to the bank. Yeah. Now let's put this in, in perspective. All of my life, living standards of ordinary working class people have been going backwards. Wages have been falling. Rent has been going through the roof. Council has been sold off. Our education system has become commodified. If you want to get educated, you've got to be in debt. Our NHS is being privatised. Our pensions are being plundered. Our public services, wherever we turn, are being used as a cash cow for money multinational corporations who've got no loyalty to people in this country, who've got no input into the public services that we rely on. Half of them don't even pay tax. They're stripping this country of wealth. They're taking that money out of our public services and they're sending it away to tax havens for the super rich. And we've got a political class who have connived and colluded in that robbery of all we need. Politicians in this country, I don't care what colour they are, blue, yellow, red, whatever, they have all colluded in that plunder of our public services. They have all colluded in a mass transfer of wealth away from ordinary people to the super rich. Right now we've got the sharpest fall in living standards out of any of the G7 countries. You see the rise of homeless people on our streets. You see the rise of people in desperate need. People in work going to food banks, claiming benefits. We've got more food banks now than we've got McDonald's in this country. And what's the government's answer? Cut taxes for the rich. Look after the bankers who smashed our economy up and nearly brought the world economy to a stand in 2008. Look after them. Look after the private corporations who are sucking wealth out of our services and give the workers a kick in if they dare to stand up. Well, let me tell you this, members of my trade union in the RMT who worked through this pandemic and watched the millions and millions and millions being taken out of our industry, a lot of it your money, taxpayers funding that, they watched those millions of people go to tax savings. We didn't strike during the health emergency, and I'll tell you why we didn't, because we wanted to make sure the nurses got to where they had to be. We wanted to make sure the care workers got to look after our old people. That's the only reason. We need to go into strike action in this health emergency. But now we've come out the other side of it. What do we see? A government that wants to give us a kick in. They wanted to isolate the RMT because they thought they could rely on old arguments. It's the greedy RMT, the union barons they call us, holding the country to ransom, holding you to ransom. And your inconvenience when we stop the trains and it's a scandal, and they thought they would pick that fight they would bring in anti-trade union legislation to crush us, and then everyone else would go quietly. Well, not this time, I'm telling you, not this time. Yeah. And when I say we, I mean all of us in the working class movement. We did not let them isolate the RNT. We did not let them divide us by pitting railway workers against nurses and nurses against teachers and everyone else against immigrants. We didn't let them do that this time. We, we, we bit the bullet, we took a strike action and we helped our brothers and sisters and other trade unions to come forward and get their strikes going. And now on October the 1st, we've got national strike action on the railway, on London Overground, on buses, alongside the postal workers, alongside the Azalef for the TSSA and Unite, because together we can achieve far more than we can on our own. We're not finished with that. That's only the beginning. We could not let the light isolate us in the RMT, but now what we've got to do is not let them isolate the trade union movement. That's what they want to do. They want to isolate the trade union movement, and that is why this campaign is so important. Because what we've got to do is bring the trade unions together with the faith groups, with the community groups, with people who are in workplaces who've got no trade union. 
who've got no community group to work in, ordinary people who want to stand up and make their voices heard. You can do that in this campaign. And we want to bring people together so they can't isolate the trade unions. Because united, we're far stronger than we are divided, and that's the message we've got to bring to people. And that's why on October the 1st, we're taking this national strike action, and we're calling for everybody to get involved in a wave of national protests, supporting those strikes, holding rallies in 13 cities, demonstrations, marches from picket lines, one to the other. We're bringing railway workers together with posters. We're bringing ordinary people together with the trade unions, faith groups together with the ordinary people in their community groups, because together we can create the pressure we need to drive the politicians into doing the right thing. And it's my view, it's about time they did a day's work for the people that elected them. Yeah. Yeah. We can even have a situation in this country where we can build homes for people. We can have an education system to look after our young and teach them. We can have an health service to look after people when they're sick. And we can have pensions so people can retire with dignity in their own age. We can have houses that are fit for people. We can do that. Or we can have investment opportunities for multinational corporations and for speculators, but we can't have both. And that's a simple fact. Yeah. What it comes down to is this. Who owns what? Yeah. Either we're going to own our railways and our public health system and our energy, or the corporations are going to own it and they're going to have profits at the expense of our higher uh, bills and low wages. Or we can own those things. And we can run them in the interests of the people in this country. And we can have higher wages and lower prices at the expenses of profits. And it's that simple. If you want wages to go up and you want prices to come down, then profits have got to come down. Because if you've got high prices but wages aren't going up, the only thing that's happening is there's a bigger share of the wealth created in this country leaving in the form of profits. And that is what is happening right now.
trains coming in this country? I can feel it. Can you feel it? Yes! They're not going to take the piss out of us anymore. We're not going to get organised. And let me tell you this, being angry is not enough. We have got to get organised. There's people out there, we don't have to explain to them what is wrong. They know it's wrong, but they can't afford their bills. People know it's wrong if you're working 40, 50, 60 hours. You can't feed your kids, you've got to go to a food bank. You don't need a degree to understand that that's wrong. People know it's wrong. What we've got to do is get people to act on that. People have got to act on what they know is wrong, and we've got to give them the means to do it. And that is what this campaign is about, and that's why we're supporting it. So on October the 1st, I want everyone to get out on the streets, because that's the next step. We have got to get people out of apathy and into action. We've got to get people out of despair and into hope. We've got to get people taking forms of peaceful civil disobedience alongside strike action. We've got to create the biggest wave of solidarity in this country, on the streets and the picket lines, to force these politicians, no matter what badge they wear, to stand by ordinary people in this country instead of the super rich. And I believe we can do that. And thank you for coming out today. <laughs> Okay, there's more fun than Bobby, mate. <laughs>